Um, his beer and cider writing appears in local and national publications, and he also is an organizer of festivals and wonderful gatherings in our beer community. So welcome, Brian. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to this. So I wanna begin today by um, opening up the floor to you, Christina, and asking you to provide us a little bit of a state of where we are in beer right now. What did 2020 look like for us with the COVID-19 pandemic on a statewide and regional level? And what new opportunities and challenges do you see us um, facing as an industry? Great. Um, so, I mean, as everyone on this webinar is, is aware, 2020 was the most difficult year that I think most of us have experienced. Um, the beer industry was one of the hardest hit uh, economically just across the gamut, along with the hospitality industry, and that came with all of the closures. Um, we lost 90% of draft, was basically eliminated overnight last March when the state shut down. Um, and so many, many of our members, that was their primary source for revenue was draft product, um, whether it was at bars, at restaurants, at their very own breweries or tap rooms and brew pubs. Um, so 2020 became a year of pivoting and innovation and trying to find outlets for just gaining back those sales um, without access to on-site consumption. So those that were lucky enough to have access to packaging materials and whether they had on-site uh, canning or bottling lines or had the ability to bring in um, mobile packagers, they were able to move into package and either distribute that from their breweries, uh, tasting rooms, tap rooms and whatnot, um, or uh, a lot of shift to direct to consumer. So shipping and those that were lucky enough to have vehicles and manpower move to delivery, which Sonia Maria, I know you know all about <laughs> home delivery. Um, so it, it, it was a very just, trepid year. Um, a lot of bouncing back and forth. You know, we last summer as we saw some reopening starting to happen um, and then spikes in cases, which, you know, caused restrictions to be tightened again. We had the fires last fall, which unfortunately affected quite a few of our members, whether it was um, potential evacuations or quality of air. So even with the, the reopening, outdoor seating was the only option. And then you bring on the fires and all of the smoke, which turned into closures again. Um, so it, it, Oregon saw a, a, a substantial negative economic impact. Um, it continues to be kind of a yo-yo effect between restrictions loosening, reopening, um, with restaurants and bars starting to reopen, you're starting to see those draft sales come back. Um, but if you look at the barrelage sold in the state of Oregon, the end of year 2019 to the end of year 2020, it was a 400,000 barrel loss between the, those years. So um, it, that's a lot of beer to have to make up. Um, in a short period of time. So my, um, we're starting to see um, shelf space taken back over. We're starting, we're starting to see draft moving, um, people back inside eating, outside eating with vaccinations on the rise. That's a good sign. Um, although now with the new mandate and the new guidance, um, I think people are still hesitant to um, take masks off inside as far as business owners. Um, you're starting to see live music happen again um, here in Central Oregon. I've seen like Silver Moon has brought live music back, Worthy has brought live music back. Um, so that that's a positive um, as far as business. Um, sorry, my train of thought, did I, what question did I miss? <laughs> that is perfect, Christina. Thanks so much for giving us that overview. My brain is so full of information right now. Um, <laughs> between that and, and just the legislative work too, we, our industry fought a pretty difficult fight against uh, alcohol tax increase. Um, I don't know if those watching are aware, but uh, there was a bill that was trying to be pushed through that would have increased our alcohol taxes by about 27, 2800%. Um, yeah, <laughs> which would have in turn put a lot of people out of business. Um, so from the guild perspective, we spent a lot of energy in that 
um, trying to to kill that bill, which happened. Um, we still have some fight um, on a potential beer tax increase, but we will continue to work with our membership and and fight that fight as well. Thank you so much. So many moving parts that as small business owners and um, members of the industry, we are all juggling. I'm eager to hear from you, Ben, a little bit about how Breakside has weathered this time and also hear a little bit more about your sort of strategy. I know that um, Breakside is expanding regionally and uh, I know our friends in Lake Oswego are very excited to see you there soon um, and that you just opened up a beer cart at the, or beer, beer, I don't know what it's called exactly. You have a specific name for it, but go ahead and share with Beer it. cart's fine, yeah. Beer, beer, cart. beer station, yeah. Your station. Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear Ben a little bit specifically about Breakside and how you're you're navigating all this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this was, I think that what the last year really did, I mean, it forced our hand on a few um, kind of decisions that maybe we would have preferred to wait a year or two to move on. Um, you know, going into 2020, we were, um, kind of at max capacity at the size of brewery we were in our facility right now. And so we were hoping to make it a year or two more kind of coasting at the volume and size we were to save up some money to be able to fund a larger expansion, which allows allow us to expand our packaging options and potentially add on additional retail locations too. And this is all part of kind of a larger three or four or five year plan. Uh, and obviously, COVID scrambled all of the plans, at least in the sense that like we, the timeline was changed. And so we had to um, do things sooner than we wanted to, including doing a complete reorganization of our production facility to allow for us to buy and install a new canning line that would allow us to shift to a higher volume of um, packaged beer. So we did that over the course of last summer. It was a pretty brutal summer for us. Uh, but once we got the canning line purchased, shipped, uh, paid for, installed, and up and running, which, you know, I think it was around October 1st that we started to uh, be able to can beer on our own in any real volume. We started to see those sales tick back up. Um, and since then, things have been really good. It also forced us to move a little bit faster on these, uh, on opening these satellite locations. So Lake Oswego, Beaverton, and then the 82nd uh, Avenue food carts uh, that you mentioned, Sonia Marie, we had been planning on doing that throughout the next couple of years where we'd be adding these uh, additional tap rooms so we could kind of mix some more retail sales into our overall um, sales channels and portfolio. Uh, and it just got expedited. You know, we just had to pull the trigger on those things sooner. So in a lot of ways, it didn't really change our plans, I wouldn't say. It's just kind of changed the timeline in which we've had to do things. Um, but, you know, in good, in good news, this is... Uh, I want to say April of 2021 was our biggest month since July of 2019, and May will probably be the sixth or fifth largest month in the history of our company. So uh, we've gotten, we, we expect that June, July, August are only going to be better for us, um, you know, knock on, knock on wood. But uh, yeah, that's where we're, we're at right now. Thank you so much, Ben. I know that, um, Breakside continues to, to grow in both its innovation um, with its new barrel, you know, emphasis on new barrel aging stuff coming out. Um, and those of you that ordered the um, six pack beer, there is a beautiful um, beer there. Can you tell us a little bit about um, rainbows about and unicorns? Beer? Yeah, rainbows yeah. and unicorns is our uh, kind of Easy drink in IPA. Uh, it is, we, this is a beer we've made actually since, this is a funny story, um, if I can take a second to tell this, is years ago during, uh, I've, when you wanted to enter a new beer uh, into the Oregon Brewers Fest, when you wanted to get into the Oregon Brewers Fest, the application for this July, end of July festival came out in like January, you know? And as a small brewery or a newer brewery, you were encouraged to, produce a special beer, a new beer, a one-off beer for it. But when you filled out the application in January, you were supposed to tell them what the beer was going to be as well as what the name was going to be. 
And I got an email from someone on our team, you know, this is like in early 2015, be like, hey, OBF applications due today. We need to know what you're going to brew. And I'm like, I don't know what we're going to brew six months from now for a one-off draft beer in the middle of the summer. Like, and um, so I was, I think I was actually lying in bed filling out this application at that point. And I decided, I just wrote out the words session rice IPA. And I was like, for a name, we're just going to call it rainbows and unicorns. Um, and that it stuck. And what was even more fortuitous was that then this beer uh, was supposed to brew on an afternoon uh, in early June of 2015. And we had some sort of snafu the day that it was supposed to get brewed, so it got delayed to the next morning. And that following morning was the morning that the Supreme Court announced its decision in Obergefell v. Hodges legalizing gay marriage nationally. And of course, it seems like that's an especially appropriate name given the, uh, given the beer as a June brew. Um, so yeah, uh, turns out though the story is good, but the beer is also very good and it's hung on for uh, many years. Seven years later, we're still brewing it and it's one of our six pack beers. It's a IPA made with galaxy hops as well as some other Southern hemisphere hops. Um, a little bit of El Dorado, which gives it kind of this pineapple um, candied fruit quality. And then there's a little bit of an old school American hop called Comet in there as well that uh, provides some peachiness. So hopefully if, you're, if you have it and enjoy it, um, it's only about five and a half percent. It's really a pale ale, but IPA sells better when you say it that way. So um, yeah, enjoy. Sorry, that was it's more air time than I should have taken. Perfect yes. lunchtime beer if you need to go back to um, afternoon meetings after this. So thanks, Ben. Um, speaking of festivals and We've seen that the Oregon um, Brewers Fest has been canceled for the second year in a row. And festivals and community events have been a really big way for breweries both to get exposure, but also for our community to get together, both consumers and producers. Um, Brian, I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of, a, of an update on where you see um, festivals going and how you have seen COVID-19 impact um, those things and, and any innovative things you've seen along the way? Certainly, uh, I, I will try to address all of that. Uh, I will start with uh, one of my events that I do, it's called Baker's Dozen uh, and it originated in Portland. It continues to run in Portland. Uh, it was created, I wanna say in 2015, the year that the uh, Craft Brewers Conference which is a, a, a migratory uh, conference and that year it landed in Portland. And I thought, well, I wanna do something for friends you know, from around the country who are coming to Portland. Uh, so obviously it had to involve beer. I didn't want it to just be beer. And uh, at that time, I remember realizing or learning that there were an equal number of independent coffee roasters in the city of Portland as breweries, that number was right around 60 at the time. Obviously uh, that's increased. And then just thinking about how, when people come to Portland, you could tell that they were visitors by the fact that when they're leaving, when they're at PDX, they have that box, you know, that pink box of, of donuts. So I thought, let's celebrate the breweries, let's celebrate the roasters and show them that there's more than just Voodoo Donuts, nothing against Voodoo, but with, there's a lot of great places. So that is how this event called Baker's Dozen originated. Um, in the first year, I thought maybe, you know, 200 people would show up um, and it had sold out. And then just because it takes so much planning, unlike the larger festivals, OBF uh, as a shining example, where you have you know, tens of thousands of people who enter the, the grounds uh, over the course of that event. I have, I've just capped it at, at 500 tickets. Uh, that's the perfect number for me to, for ordering beer, inviting the roasters. I know exactly how many donuts, you know, I, I quarter them uh, for, for guests to, to ensure that everyone gets their sample of everything, that they're not you know, being asked to, to consume too much or they're not getting too little, they're not getting sold out of anything, uh, which I know is a disappointment, even at OBF where there was 79 other beers, but as soon as one kicks, that's the one that everyone says they, they need it. So again, 500 people and uh, it, the, the sixth annual was set to take place uh, in mid 
March, 2020. And I just remember it was a few days earlier that I had to send out the announcement to everyone, um, hey, don't worry, we're going into a two week shutdown. I don't know if I'm gonna put this on in the beginning of April, but guaranteed, you have my word, this event will take place, even if it has to be on December 31st, 2020. And obviously, uh, if we only had known then what we know now. So, you know, I, I really try to focus on putting on more specialty sort of niche beer festivals. Um, and, and part of that maybe was my personal reaction to uh, an expression that I think certainly people in the industry have heard, and I don't know how much it, it uh, gets thought about outside, but among the consumer set, which is beer fest fatigue. You, you heard a lot about that. It seemed as if every single weekend there were two or three festivals, certainly around Oregon. It's why, you know, we're known as Birvana and it's why uh, you could put on so many really awesome destination worthy events. Uh, I certainly know that, that I was attracting people from out of state. I, obviously when you have an event like OBF, um, you're attracting people from other countries, you know, who, who want to sort of use it as their anchor for visiting Portland and, and exploring the beer culture. And they have this phenomenal event that, that gets to be the hub of their purpose of, of their visit. So when you, take those events away, not only, you know, has Oregon, uh, has, has OBF now been on hiatus for, for two years or two, two uh, rotations of that event, uh, but it really does affect the greater hospitality industry. All those hotel rooms, obviously not just because there was no OBF, but no one's traveling, no one's visiting. Uh, all the restaurants, all the tap rooms, all of that. So I, I think, you know, you asked about, well, what does it look like going forward? Yes, there are some people who are putting, who are scheduling their events for summer and fall of 2021. Uh, I beg and, and plead and pray that that does get to happen. Certainly not just because of the, the couple, you know, things that I put on, but as a, a fan, as an attendee, as a consumer myself, I'm dying to go to those. Um, I think that in the short run, that whole notion of beer fest fatigue is definitely out the window. I think that people, you, you could basically say, hey, I'm opening a six pack of eight month old beer, but it's a party and, and you're going to have people pounding down your door to get in. I think that's what we will see in the near future. Um, I, and, and as far as long term, it is too soon to, to determine if people will ultimately change their behavior and, and that pattern or will fall back into it. Um, but I think as long as you are offering something that people want and are interested in, and there's a good experience. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we have seen as far as the pivot goes is uh, even more of an emphasis and a desire for experiences and, and experiential, you know, uh, entertainment. So in my opinion, what is a greater experience than getting together with like-minded people and drinking delicious beers? Usually as Ben mentioned, you know, OBF and, and so many of the festivals, I, I'm guilty of this uh, too when I put on ones, people want to offer unique, you know, one-off beers. Um, so all the coffee beers I do are generally, you know, have to be made for that event. Um, the other events that I do, either they're unique or maybe they're rare. Maybe they're just hard to obtain in, in uh, the city that the event is being held in. So, you know, as, as far as what happened, obviously in the past year plus, um, I know that I personally have pivoted towards offering online virtual beer tastings. I've had some pretty good luck with that, I'm happy to say, where I was hired or, or arranged to do uh, private beer tastings. And I would always be able to cater it towards that audience, whether it was you know, a small group of friends or a large company. 
Um, so I was doing anywhere from from four to uh, to eighty people is is pretty much the group that I had, um, and it, it's great because obviously that offers safety, it offers security. You don't have to worry about driving, drinking, and driving anything like that. But I'll be honest, as much as I will continue to offer doing those. I'd love to not have to do them again because I want to get back in person. And, you know, it wasn't just, I, I want to take one quick second to say it wasn't just the impact of the pandemic that greatly uh, hit the beer industry. Um, this past year was momentous, it was tumultuous in, in many ways. And it's worth noting or, or, or speaking about how issues of harassment to women in the industry and not women in the industry, but consumers, uh, patrons of, of brew pubs, beer festivals have, you know, that, that people such as myself who never experienced that and probably didn't uh, know that it was taking place to the extent that it is. Uh, and then beyond uh, women in the industry, obviously, other minorities, people of color. So there's been a, a huge reckoning that didn't start with the beer industry, but has, it, it certainly didn't avoid the beer industry. And to the industry at large's credit, I want to say, I feel like it is doing a good job of trying to tackle this and do the work rather than sweep anything under the rug. There's absolutely a lot more work that needs to be done and is being done. So it's not just aluminum can shortages that, that were the headaches of, of brewery owners, but all these other issues, certainly learning, you know, discovering, hearing uh, that some of their employees were, were part of this problem. Um, so that, that is absolutely ongoing at this moment. And I think that that will have a huge impact on the future of events as well, finding out ways to not just make them more uh, inclusive, but also safer uh, spaces for, for events, for people who didn't necessarily feel welcome in the first place and now really understanding how far that degree of not being welcomed uh, impacted them. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, you mentioned, you know, a couple of these challenges um, that we've faced. Christina mentioned the forest fires, which affected both our our um, our um, breweries being open, but also our hop farms and our raw materials. Um, aluminum can shortage in in regards to packaging. Um, this larger global movement for social justice. We certainly have felt all these things. Um, I have a question here from uh, someone in the audience who wants to know specifically a little bit about market saturation. So what is the status of, uh, more specifically the Portland beer market and um, is the market too saturated? We, we sort of had this, this growth of a lot of breweries. Um, what has become of the breweries that have closed also? What's going on with those? Um, and I open that up to, to anyone that wants to share, um, Ben or Christina. Well, I can, I, I can jump in about the breweries that have closed, just some of them. Um, I saw in the, the question whether those assets are being sold off and, and some are yes, some are turnkey um, facilities. Uh, we just saw the, the Portland Brewing um, just had their auction. So um, you, the Brewers Association put out their numbers and there were more openings than closures in 2020. So people are still opening breweries, it's happening. And those that are closing are being turned over. So um, I feel like that that is a, is a good sign that people are still interested in the industry and, and keeping it moving forward. As far as the saturation though, Ben, do you wanna, do you wanna to speak to saturation in Portland? Yeah, I feel like the saturation question has been like a parlor game for the last uh, 10 years, you know, 12 years. Longer, um, yeah. Back when yeah. we thought, back when there were, you know, there's so for, for those who aren't in it day in, day out, there's 9,000 breweries in the United States and we were worried we were at a saturation point when there were 2,000 breweries, uh, which was only 10 years ago. So it's pretty crazy to see the way the market has gone from, you know, 4x, 400% uh, growth or four doubling since the 
uh, you know, just since we opened in 2010. You know, I, I think one thing that has to be understood with the relationship between, there's two things I think that need to be understood when it comes to talking about number of breweries. Um, and, and Brian loves to uh, talk about how hard it is to count breweries, right? Because sometimes, uh, you know, does Breakshead count as three breweries? Because we have three locations that all make beer. Do we count as six breweries? Because we have six physical locations where we sell beer, you know, or are we one brewery? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I'll let him uh, answer those questions. But from my point of view, when you're talking about the number of breweries that can exist in the market or the amount of beer that can exist in the market, I think that we have to remember one, there's this big historical backfill that had to happen after not only prohibition, but the five decades after prohibition ended when basically there was this huge contraction and consolidation in the American marketplace where we went in the pre-prohibition uh, peak of maybe, you know, in 1916, say, to about 1,900, 2,000 breweries in the United States to having as few as I want to say 84, maybe even uh, fewer than that in the mid-70s, um, literally 70 breweries existing in the entire country in the mid, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And since 1980, we've seen this kind of continuous growth in the number of breweries that had a little bit of dip in the late 90s as there was some shakeout in the market and then took off again, kind of a steady growth through the early aughts. And then in the last 10 years has really um, taken, you know, a huge exponential growth. But a lot of that is just simple backfill to an increasing population in an industry that didn't have enough supply, right? So uh, what we see now is breweries are, for, for all that time, breweries could just open and be successful because there weren't enough breweries. There's still a vast undersupply of breweries to beer drinkers. And now we're at the point, I think we're in a more mature marketplace where you're gonna see kind of a balance between openings and closings. It's more of a uh, homeostasis in the market. The other thing, in my opinion, about saturation, that's hard to kind of, why it makes it a hard question to answer is that not all breweries are the same size. Do I think we're saturated in terms of large regional breweries? Yeah, kind of, I don't think, I think it's gonna be harder and harder for someone to grow to the size that we did at the rate that we did. Um, given the landscape as it is now. I think, but like in terms of small breweries that are uh, tap room only models that are making a few hundred barrels of beer a year, I don't know that we're near the saturation point on that because there's a lot of innovation going on in that space about how to get beer to consumers. And that can provide people lots of opportunities to um, create new businesses that are successful. So it's a tricky question to answer. I know that's kind of an evasive answer, but um, it, is, it is more complicated than just thinking that there's a number of breweries that the market can handle and that's that. Thanks, Ben. Brian, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to add a, a, a few things. Obviously, uh, you both hit on, you hit on some good points there. Uh, first and foremost, I want to address my personal definition. Uh, I would count Breakside as one brewing company or brewing concern. I would count it as three breweries because you have three separate manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, and then everything I'm with else. You on that. I agree with you on that definition. I'm good with that. Excellent. <laughs> so, but, but you do see some places, um, and I'll, I'll use San Diego. Uh, I, I love to sort of poke the bear. Um, it's just fun for me. I think San Diego is rightfully, rightfully one of the uh, craft beer destinations in the world and, and certainly in the country. Uh, but they love to brag, you know, how many breweries they have, but they, they, count all of their their satellite tap rooms or tasting rooms um so i personally don't that's just my personal definition uh so again so if, if breakside is operating six sites that exclusively serve its beer three of which brew beer on premise in my opinion my definition that's three breweries uh not to say that all six aren't worth visiting same for anything in, in San Diego, et cetera. Uh, when, when I get asked about, don't we have enough breweries? Aren't we saturated? I always say there are two types of places that prove that we are not. One, if you are a prospective brewery open, uh, owner, you want to look uh, to a market that is underserved. Um, and that could be, you know, some town of basically at this point, you know, any population, 1,000 or more, but generally if you have a city that's 10,000 or more that happens to not have a brewery, even at this point, by all means, 
stake your claim, open up a brewery there. Uh, but the other is a city like Portland, where that you know there's over 70 breweries in Portland Metro. But if anything, cities like Portland, like Seattle, Denver, Chicago, San Diego have proven that it's not just some pocket of the of the community that drinks and supports craft beer. It is ubiquitous. So any city like Portland that's going to support 70 breweries clearly has a, a deep felt love of this type of business and that product and will gladly support 71. So I do not think uh, that, that the industry has reached a saturation point. I think that if you look at the wine world, you know, as Ben mentioned, we have about 9,000, maybe more breweries across the country, but we have well over 20,000 bonded wineries. And you never, ever hear someone say too many wineries. As long as there's a doctor or lawyer who wants to retire, there's gonna be a new brewery. And sort of the same thing goes for beer, except as Ben also uh, wisely brought up, was the downturn uh, in the, the mid to late 90s into the early aughts. And the problem there, really, if I could sort of paint with a broad brush, was too many people got into the industry with these dollar signs in their eyes and had absolutely no clue what it meant to, to brew good, clean beer. So a lot of those sort of, you know, suit and tie types who, who just thought, oh, this is going to be easy money. Uh, it's like a license to, to brew money. Learn the hard way. They had no clue what they were doing. They didn't understand the product. Then with this second, you know, or maybe third wave of, of rapid growth, you had all these home brewers, these talented award-winning home brewers who said, God, I keep winning these uh, homebrew competitions. Maybe I could go pro. So we knew that they had the passion and the talent for making good beer. Unfortunately, they might not have had the business acumen because the beer business is called that for a reason. You have to brew beer and you have to be good at business. Um, so when breweries close, whether uh, you know it's in Portland, whether it's uh, here in Bend or Central Oregon or pretty much anywhere, at this point in time, I feel like it often doesn't have to do with their quality of their beer. They just didn't understand the business side or life. Life got in the way. There was a death. There was a divorce. There was something that happened and they couldn't stay afloat with all the other turmoil going on. Um, there are so many classic examples of, of phenomenal breweries that everyone loved then they closed. So you know it wasn't, oh, they couldn't sell beer. Um, obviously, they couldn't sell enough beer, you know, is sort of the thing. So uh, until, you know, and also to add to the, the winery part, Americans just drink more beer by volume than wine. So until we get to that point where there are more breweries than wineries, I will absolutely insist we have not reached a saturation point. I just think you have to be really, really prudent. How big do you want your brewing company to be. Uh, if you, you know, also as Ben said, if you want to be a big regional powerhouse, maybe, maybe we're too uh, late to, to get into that game. At the same time, every year the Brewers Association released, releases its list of the top 50 breweries, and there's always new entries every single year. I've seen friends of mine a decade ago who said, hey, I'm starting a brewery. I'm like, all right, good luck. And now I'm seeing those names on, appear on the top 50. Uh, and, and I wholeheartedly believe, I'm not saying this because uh, Ben is on this group, but I could envision Breakside being on that list one day. Obviously, they're, they're always looking at growth opportunities and expanding uh, their distribution and their audience. So when you build smartly, when you have a long-term plan, um, it's funny, you know, uh, Ben could tell you, obviously, uh, Breakside's founder, Scott, could tell you this was not part of what, of what was uh, in the cards back in, was it 2012 that, that Breakside opened? 2010. 2010, even farther. Yeah. 
We're like super old for the beer industry. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> 11 years ago, no way you or Scott imagined that there would be six breakside locations. And, and that's just the first six. So there is room for growth. If you, if you brew great beer and you have a good welcoming space and you're offering something that people appreciate and relate to, that will never go out of style. That will never be a fad. There will always be room. So I don't recommend everyone drop what they're doing and, and leave their engineering and their tech jobs and all that to start a brewery. But if you have the passion and the know-how and you have a good team in place, by all means, uh, get into it, start a new brewery. Uh, you, will, you will find the success, however you defined it, uh, that, that you're after. Thanks all. Um you know, having navigated the, the brewery ownership here, um, it's, it's all true what you're saying. Um, we are now seven years old and, and stayed small purposefully so that we could be sustainable. Um, and um, there's a lot of, of more growth opportunity for folks, but it is ultimately a business. Um, and, and you have to run it that way and um, bringing in folks that have the expertise around distribution, around um, you know, sourcing smartly your ingredients, building those connections, just like in any other place. Um, one thing that you know, stays central though is, is obviously the beer. Um, and we have seen that you know, IPAs, at least in our area, are, are king. Um, and I think a lot of consumers have been fatigued by that and are wondering, what's next? What else are we, what else are we gonna be drinking? Um, what is interesting and um, innovative or perhaps making a comeback? Um, what trends do you see emerging in the next few years around um, the actual product? I'll just open that up to anyone. So no, no one is chiming in or no one's <laughs> coming in first. Uh, I am happy to do that. And I, only because I was thinking about it this morning, I went to a couple different markets uh, and, I, and I, whether I'm there for, for bananas and broccoli or whatever, I'm always, always gonna look at the beer section. Um, and usually I'll be weak-willed and, and end up making a purchase. So, the purchases that I made today, uh, in addition to this very, very tasty IPA, Wanderlust by Breakside, uh, I bought Block 15's ESB. Now, Ben, you know, just said, you know, he started 11 years ago, that some of us, anyone, that anyone who's older than, than 22 at this point is sort of old by industry standards. But there was a time before IPA, there was a time when people drank beers that did not end in the letters IPA. Uh, and ESB had been an old favorite. So I sort of make it a point to whenever I see an ESB, I, I buy it because it's not just enough to say, ah, when are hazes gonna be over? The reason hazes are the the, you know, the, the, the benchmark, the, the tent pole for the industry is because people are buying them like mad. So you'd be an idiot not to, to make the best selling style of beer, you, just plain and simple. Now, it's not that I don't like hazies. I'm, I'm happy to drink them. It's not all I wanna drink. So I realized that I need to vote with my dollars. So I bought the Block 15 ASB and I bought the Away Days bitter. And then I bought uh, a rice lager from Roos. And obviously, Ben, you mentioned rice in rainbows and unicorns. I, I hope that that's still a part of the, the grist. Uh, you know, we're absolutely seeing a huge wave of crispies, right? These easily crushable, sessionable lagers and, and, and light beers like that. And, and there's a comment here uh, from someone, um, Aaron Perlman, he asks, when will the IPA craze be over? Can we have a porter craze, an amber craze, a brown ale craze? No, we cannot have an amber craze. I'm sorry, Aaron, we cannot do it. But the reason is no one's gonna buy all that amber. 
all you could do is keep, if, if you love Amber, I'm not that guy, but if you're the guy who loves Amber or girl, you, you need to buy the Amber. You, just complaining about it is not going to keep that beer style on shelves or on tap. So uh, I really, you know, I do love Porter. I, I, I love all the dark beers. I love Schwartz beer. I love Dunkel's. So the way that I voice my desire to keep seeing those is I buy them and I drink them. Uh, and I and maybe I make a note to tell the brewer how much I loved that particular beer. Uh, I happen to be part of a super duper esoteric Facebook group called This Week in Rauch Beer. Uh, will there ever be a Rauch Beer trend or craze or fad? Will we ever see, you know, nine out of 20 taps be smoked beers? No way in hell but we definitely should have at least one of those 20 or 80 taps be a smoke beer. And the only way to make that sure that happens is to actually order it. So the craze will always be what the people actually want. And right now, yeah, it's not brewers who are saying, I need a way to move all this mango puree and mochi out of the warehouse. They're ordering the mango puree and the mochi and the marshmallow fluff because that's what their customers are demanding and they're buying it. So you don't wanna see mango mochi marshmallow milkshake IPA, don't buy it. As long as someone's buying it, you're gonna see that beer on shelves and on draft and whatever it is you want, whether it's a, you, know, you, you said, is it innovation or is it sort of a retro thing? Um, it, it's one of my personal favorite things about being a beer drinker in Oregon is that you absolutely, whether it's you know on retail shelves or in, in tap rooms, you definitely see a, a wide variety of beer styles. And I, it, it kills me because I hear from people in other states who say, no, can't find an amber. I'm looking for it, I cannot find an amber. I cannot find a porter that is like a 5% porter. All I could find is an imperial cacao nib, coconut, you know, black forest cake porter. If you want to, to see those porters, vote with your, your comments, your, 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 you know, your, uh, your communication with the brewery, but most of all your, your money, because that's the only way to, to keep beers around or to get them around. Um, and at the same time, if you want more innovation, if you want more experimentation with everything from exotic fruits that you've never heard of to animal parts, you know, I guess that's, that's how you vote for those beers is by buying those. Thanks, Brian. I will say, um, like I'm brewing, just does have an amber, and burning for you. Um, we also recently released an amber with chanterelle mushrooms. Um, it brought in, you know, sort of a little twist to it. So, Sometimes it's about also going to diverse producers and going outside of what you might be finding at Fred Meyer. Um, not that Fred Meyer doesn't carry wonderful brands. Like I, I was in at our local Fred Meyer and snapped a picture of this amazing display and sent it to Ben. I was blown away of, of Wanderlust with the beautiful wolves. And I just thought, my goodness, to go into the store and see your baby like that. Um, I know the first time that our beers went on tap at just a local bar, I, I was overwhelmed with it. So, um, yeah, but it's a little, it's a little producers is also really important. I do want to add one, one thing, if I may interject, which is there's a huge difference in, uh, core brands and one-offs, right. Or, and I don't even just mean seasonals, like limited availability beers that you see every year, but are you going to have an amber with chanterelles all the time? That is a beer, and I'm just speaking for myself personally, I don't even love mushrooms, but if I see an amber with, with chanterelles in it, absolutely, lutely, I'm definitely gonna order that beer. Um, again, as, as a non-mushroom lover, I found a lot of beers with mushrooms that I really do enjoy. I will mention that I think uh, candy cap mushrooms are the perfect- brewing. Hands down, hands down. Ben, so, you were saying. Yeah, so it's one-off versus how do you get someone to buy that beer over and over again? I think that, uh, first, first, I mean, two thoughts on this. One is, I encourage people to, you have to go visit breweries because the, the package marketplace versus the 
we're talking about kind of like finding the diverse and quirky styles out there. A lot of breweries brew those beers. They just don't package them. And there's any number of reasons that it doesn't make sense to do those beers for, you know, distribution to the wide market. Um, and large, the largest being, as Brian kind of uh, pointed out, like just IPAs sell like crazy. So you're going to package those because that's your volume beer. Um, and those pet projects can be three barrel, four barrel, five barrel, one-off batches that linger on tap. They don't need to move quite as quickly, but in order to get them to the consumer, the consumer has to come to the brewery. And so that's, you know, the, the responsibility, partially of the consumer, partially of the brewery to make that uh, connection. But you know, like in this year's Oregon Beer Awards entries, for example, um, if you look at, you know, we have about 29 different categories uh, that span the entire spectrum of beer and if you can kind of like group some of those categories together. And if uh, obviously the overall, the hoppy beers are the largest uh, number of entries, but the second largest are what I would call kind of like classic pub styles, ambers, browns, porters, uh, other classic English styles, red beers, things like that, that just don't get a lot of package distribution. So those beers are being made. I mean, they made up over uh, 5% of the competition uh, no, sorry, over 10% of the competition's entries this year. So there are, they're out there. The other thing, and this is, a, you know, I'm going to make the plug for IPAs. I'm going to make the plug for modern hops here, which is that if you don't think you like IPAs, I really encourage you to go to some of the world-class IPA producers who are making some of the best IPAs in the world in the Northwest and try those beers. It might just be you don't like old IPA, like old school IPA that was overly bitter, overly caramely, really unpleasant to drink a lot of the time. And you might not like bad IPA, but I don't like bad Brussels sprouts. I still <laughs> love Brussels sprouts, you know? So it's like, it has to be good. So, um, you know, I think that like the mastery with which brewers have been able to coax out better, more pleasant, more interesting aromas and flavors in hops into, the, into IPAs has just changed dramatically in the last seven, eight years. I mean, I look back at the first IPAs we made in 2010, 2011, 2012, and it wasn't just because we were a new brewery that we weren't doing as well as we are now. It's also because the raw materials weren't as good as they are now. The knowledge about how to manage hops wasn't as good as they are now. The hops themselves have gotten better and are more aromatic. Um, a, actually, a, a friend of mine who thinks that all IPAs taste like old socks or dirty socks out of a hamper was tasting some of our IPAs recently. She's like, these are good. These taste fruity. They taste bright. They taste tropical. They taste piney. It's like, I don't taste sweat. I don't taste BO. Um, and so she, she was into them. Um, and so I, I, I think there's an opportunity for a lot of people to rediscover good hoppy beers. Thanks, Ben. I, I definitely agree that the evolution in, in the raw materials has been quite amazing and the innovation around hop breeding and, and all that, um, as well as, as now more specialty malts and, and interesting things coming out in that world um, as well. It, it's, it's incredible to see, you know, from the fields all the way to the pint, um, how the industry is continuing to innovate all over. Um, I have a question here from someone who's asking, what opportunities are there to build community or volunteer or help out in the local beer industry and community? Um, how can folks get involved? You know, in the past, we've been able to have volunteers at beer fests. Um, and are there any upcoming events that folks can, can participate in? Um, and thoughts on that? Any ideas? Well, we will have our, our Portland Fresh Hop Fest. I'm, I'm pushing through to hold that event um, later this fall. So um, the Guild, is, we have a, a volunteer list. Uh, we also have an enthusiast membership program um, and the majority of those enthusiast members sign up as volunteers for our events. Um, and, you know, moving, looking out to 2022, when we get back to normal, um, you know, we'll have a handful of different events, uh, guild related events that you can volunteer at. Um, and then happy to, to also connect folks with um, regional events that are happening and, and volunteer. Um, if you go to our website, I, I put the address, it's oregoncraftbeer.org um, and sign up, scroll down and, and 
the contact me area. If you go ahead and sign up there, um, I am happy to reach out or you can email me directly. Um, my, I'll drop my email into the chat. It's uh, Christina, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A at oregonbeer.org. Um, and I am happy to add you to our volunteer list. Thanks, Christina. I know one thing that um, as we continue to look at legis legislative um, things coming down the pipeline, you know, that's also one way that uh, the industry is always happy to receive support when there's a bill or something that is being introduced that may be harmful to our businesses. Having consumers speak out um, and, you know, speak directly to these elected officials about the potential impact of these bills on our small businesses is really critical. Um, and so as we look towards the next le legislative session, um, we may be asking you know, folks to, to help us out that way. Um, I know for us as a small business, you know, we're getting ready to, to uh, hopefully re reopen after an expansion. And so you know, we're inviting community members that, that wanna help us out to reach out as well with even things like helping us landscape, helping us paint. Um, we're really a mom and pop business. And so um, go to your local brewery and um, build a relationship with, with the owners and, and the people there um, and see how you can help out. Also encouraging folks to apply for jobs. Um, we're facing an industry-wide shortage in the hospitality world of servers and staff. So if you have anyone um, in your life that is um, looking for work, the industry is, is eager and willing to, to hire folks, um, both front of house, back of house production. There are starting to be more and more job openings. So um, we, wanna, we wanna employ people, we wanna um, provide beer for people and we wanna host people in our spaces, so. I will second that, that there is a desperate need across the state for um, hospitality folks uh, in the workforce. There, um, you're seeing businesses, breweries too, that are forced into closing certain days of the week because they just don't have the team, the manpower to keep it going. So um, I will second what Sonny Marie said. If, if you yourself or you know someone who is looking for a job, um, don't hesitate to, to check out your local breweries and brew pubs because they absolutely need your help right now. And I would like to add to that. I know Sonia, you had mentioned uh, doing a search for, for someone. Uh, I think kind of as I had addressed earlier, if you are someone who you, you like the industry, you like the community, but maybe you feel like there's not a place for you in it or you don't have the experience uh, to be in it, please banish that thought. Uh, the passion is, is the number one factor I think that people are, are looking for. Certainly not in a head brewing position. Obviously a little bit of know-how or a lot uh, is, is a prereq there, but it's just as far as volunteering, being involved, being uh, uh, an organizer, uh, someone who helps out in these things. So uh, again, you know, if you're, if you're a woman, if you're someone who just thinks like, oh, maybe I'm not the person who they're looking for, for this role, absolutely. Uh, banish that thought and, and, and step up to the plate because you're welcome and, and, and there's, there's room for everyone here. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm just going to wrap us up and just throw one last question at you with a quick answer, which is looking forward, what word or words do you feel describe the future of where we're going? in the next, let's say, year to 18 months as an Oregon beer industry? Um, Hopeful. After the last year we've had, I feel very hopeful looking ahead um, at the next year to 18 months and innovation. I guess I would say, yeah, cautious optimism is kind of where I'm at. Um, but I also think it's going to be, it's going to be an exhausting couple of years ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think there'll be some public intoxication. 
<laughs> people can't wait to go out to uh, to a, a tap room and party like it like it's late 2019. Like nine, 1919. Well, yeah. 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 19, yeah. 1917 or 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of well, drinking. Thank you all. We, we very much appreciate um, you coming and sharing with us your expertise, um, your time, your sense of humor. I feel so grateful to, um, again, have you in both of my worlds um, colliding here today. I'm so grateful. For me, my biggest word um, is community. That's what I stand for, whether it's with the beer industry or with the Jewish community. And part of our brewery is bringing those two together. And so I feel very grateful to have you here today. Um, I'm gonna hand it back over to Saul. Thank you again, Saul, for having us. And um, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Saul, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Christina. Thank you, Brian. And thank you so much, Sonia Marie. This was excellent. Um, learned a great deal as always. Um, this past weekend, I was, uh, I was up in Astoria and I had um, for the first time, uh, a beer called Hold My Pickle, uh, which was a, a pickle beer, um, and it was absolutely delicious. So as a sour beer person, I like to see the innovation that is going on. Um, so when we posted about this event, um, uh, one of the emails that I got back was about a man named Fred Eckhart, um, who played a big role in our local beer scene. Um, and Fred was a swim coach at the MJCC from some time in the lead the late 70s um, into the early to mid 80s. Um, and I guess he's the grandfather of the craft beer scene in Portland. Um, and he had a, a tremendous positive impact on this person's life and uh, so many people. So um, I don't, I didn't know Fred, but I thought that was something interesting that, you know, along with Ben, who is a former uh, JCC employee, also Fred Eckhart. So uh, you can thank the JCC for some of the beer scenes. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, I want to thank John's Marketplace, um, which is both here in Multnomah Village and over on the uh, uh, in the southeast. Um, I want to thank Danelle Romain and Mike Fries, uh, Oregon Beer and Wine Distributors Association. Um, and uh, we have uh, John's Marketplace was kind enough to offer a um, a beer prize, um, and I've used a random number generator, and the winner of the beer prize will be. Oren Bolka. Uh, Oren Bolka has won uh, a beer prize from John's market, Marketplace, so I will reach out to, to uh, Oren uh, for that prize. Um, I want to thank the rest of our sponsors, um, uh, Congregation Neva Shalom's uh, COVID-19 Outreach and Services. Uh, I want to thank Richard Barker, Wealth Management Advisor at Merrill Lynch, Barry and Carla Benson, First Republic Bank, Converts Menashe, Portland State University, Russell Hosner LLC, Jonathan Singer of Bard Singer PC, the Jerry and Her Helen Stern Grandchildren's Fund of OJCF, uh, Stuart Gordon Strauss, uh, Architect PC and Turner Construction Company. Um, and I wanna thank all of you um, for attending and being a part of this. Um, we still have some beer available. You can order it via the Lycom website. The link is in the chat. Um, and uh, again, thank you very much. Oh, I'll just show you, I have the six pack here. I have to hold it against my chest so you can see it. But look, there's a um, there's the break side and there is the gold me now. These, these are unique six packs. You can't get them everywhere. Um, but uh, if you order a couple of them, we'd love to sell them to you. And I plan to drink at least a couple of these tonight. So um, beers, not six packs beers. Um, in any case, um, good luck tonight for those of you in the uh, Oregon Beer Festival. Thank you again to our sponsors and our uh, panelists and uh, have a great day.